okay uh, uh, good morning rather good afternoon now okay uh, so can you hear me back there is it all right is it people behind okay great so uh, my name is uh, vinith bala subramanian i'm a faculty in uh, iit hyderabad and uh, yeah thanks to the organizers for inviting me here uh, to share uh, uh, some background uh, that we have done uh, background work that we have done in explainable machine learning so i will give some uh, overview of the work so far in the broader community and then talk about what we have done uh, uh, in this space so um, uh, generally i get asked wherever i go is there uh, i mean is there an iit in hyderabad so that's generally a question i i get so i think it's my duty to perhaps start by saying that there is an iit in hyderabad and it's actually not too young we are about 10 years old now so we have graduated about seven batches of students uh, so we pretty much have all the departments that are in any other uh, iit and we currently have about 2200 students so those are some of the buildings that we currently have on top and uh, i'll keep this introduction very brief because i want to focus on what i need to cover so the cs department at uh, iit hyderabad which is where uh, 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 i work out of so we have about uh, 20 faculty just kind of close to stable state for uh, most of uh, the iits probably among the newer iits that came 10 years back uh, probably we are first to reach this uh, this number and uh, our opening and closing je ranks which is one way in which people measure how well iits do are uh, improving each year so this year actually our opening and closing je ranks are somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 450 was our opening and 770 was actually our uh, closing rank for the cs department at iit hyderabad okay so uh, and uh, we have projects with uh, government academia and this industry and several student and faculty awards so if you have not been that side yeah please do visit i mean for, uh, for those of you who didn't know there was at iit hyderabad yeah please do uh, visit just a quick brief about uh, the kind of work uh, we do at our group at iit hyderabad and then i'll quickly get on to the topic so uh, very broadly we work on machine learning deep learning computer vision those are probably the key words that would so get associated with our group and within the group we do both algorithmic kind of work as well as applied work on the algorithmic side some of the things we do are non convex optimization for deep learning i think the focus of this uh, entire uh, uh, day is deep learning so uh, how do you help train deep learning methods faster how do you prove convergence guarantees for those kinds of uh, gradient descent methods that you use for deep learning is different is an important question that we try to answer explainable machine learning i'll talk about that more as we go deep generative models for uh, uh, for settings where you don't have too much supervision deep graph representations those are some what i would call data agnostic research that we do i mean we're not looking at particular applications but just trying to solve fundamental problems in in that space then the applied side most of the work that we do is on the computer vision side so broadly human behavior understanding recognition of expressions poses gestures all of that is pretty much what we do uh, of late we have a, a couple of projects on uh, doing vision with drones uh, both applications both uh, in agriculture in defense security as well as disaster management and those kinds of applications and we also have uh, uh, a long term project with japan where we are doing deep learning for agriculture so where we actually have experimental farms it's a collaboration with an agricultural university where we have drones flown over farms in hyderabad and we record uh, those videos and work with that okay just and uh, some of the venues that we try to publish our work is cvpr iccv icml nips those are the uh, venues that we typically try to target just with that quick uh, background let's me step into what uh, the focus for uh, today's session is explainability in ml so uh, broadly speaking i would uh, uh, cover uh, i mean three aspects in this particular talk the first thing is to give you an overview of what explainability in ml means what are the efforts so far so we'll talk about that then we'll have a second segment where we talk about uh, visual interpretability in cnns convolutional neural networks and uh, lastly very briefly we'll talk about future directions in this space okay so that will be the uh, outlay of the talk so some uh, things to keep in mind it's a semi technical talk probably some technical details but broadly it's a high level talk so if any of you don't want math you can still listen it's okay you shouldn't miss much uh, it's in term intermediate level talk so uh, i am going to assume that you have a basic background in deep learning anyone who's completely new to deep learning here anyone okay okay so i'm going to assume uh, i do have a couple of slides well i'll just breeze through that but otherwise the assumption is most of you know cnns rnns and at least basics of neural networks okay nothing nothing more than that and uh, obviously a focus will be computer vision because we're going to talk about cnns uh, in this particular context all right 
Okay, so um, I think all of us now, I mean, this is a redundant slide, but more to bring things into the context. I think all of us know that machine learning has been very, very successful. There have been applications ranging from science to web to marketing to manufacturing where machine learning is used on a daily basis. So we're not going to go further. And if you look at deep learning as a sub a subset of machine learning in, in a, a broader sense, it is a group of algorithms that uh, comprises a subset of machine learning models. Uh, you can very broadly, the successes of deep learning have been in the perception space, right? You look at, say, vision, text, and NLP. Very broadly, these have been the three domains in which deep learning ha has been successful, and the number of papers in this space have been increasing. And this was an inter interesting graphic that I found to uh, uh, understand the proliferation of deep learning. This is a graph that shows the number of deep learning models on Google servers. Okay, it's an interesting way of studying how deep learning has been progressing. So apparently the numbers of number of deep learning models that are on Google servers which are deployed in various applications that they have is also exponentially increasing. Okay, just one interesting way of looking at uh, how deep learning has been growing. Okay, this is something perhaps all of you know. Let's now look at uh, thing a little bit more closely. So if you look at where machine learning is today, right? If you look at all the machine learning applications that we use in practice today, then you would look at problems like what is the product relevant to the user? What is the sentiment of this tweet? What are the objects in this image? Depending on which domain, which application you're going to work on, okay? And the general abstraction out of all of these problems is what is X, right? That's the problem that you're looking at in all of, uh, all of, all of this context. And uh, if you see the applications in which you and I use machine learning in today's world, some of the observations are the cost of making a bad decision is not much, right? A bad movie recommendation, you lose 500 rupees, you lose, a, you lose three hours, that's all right, okay? That's, com that's completely all right, okay? Accuracy is often the most all important metric that you're looking for, okay? Variance of accuracy. I mean, F1 score, I'm gonna group all of them into what I call accuracy whether you call them F1 score, precision, recall, all of them are one, one particular kind of a metric that you're actually looking for. Why a particular prediction was made doesn't matter at all. As long as uh, uh, revenue is optimized, as long as the monetization is not affected, you really don't bother about why a particular prediction was made. Okay? This is where things stand at this point in time. And it's highly one-dimensional. You're trying to uh, optimize for one particular metric. You're trying to, I mean, you look at any machine learning work, the results presented are one particular metric where you see accuracy or F1 score or pretty much that's the overall framework in which most of machine learning applications operate today. Okay? And if you look at where does machine learning, where is machine learning yet to fulfill its promise, you look at complex real world systems. Okay? Where I'm not going to trust if, uh, let's say I take one of my family members to a hospital and then there is a reception desk which uses a machine learning algorithm that says, oh, your, uh, your family member is free from cancer, you can go home now. Okay. I'm not going to take that, right? I am going to, I do want, I, I would want to insist that I meet somebody uh, who has the uh, manual expertise and then get that and then, le then only go. Why? Because I want an explanation for the decision that's being made. Okay. So if you abstract this out again, places where machine learning is yet to fulfill its promise, are complex real world systems. Examples would be risk sensitive systems, that's medical diagnosis, financial modeling prediction. I think those are examples of systems where you don't directly use machine. I mean, there could be places, components, for example, in medical imaging, of course, yeah, machine learning is used to highlight particular regions in an MRI or a CT scan or things of this kind. So in subsystems, it's used, not for the final decision making. Okay, that's what I'm trying to uh, indicate here. and. Uh, a particular project that I'm personally involved in is in safety critical systems. For example, cockpit decision support. We are currently working with Honeywell, uh, where, uh, I mean, the idea is to see if, uh, if decisions have to be made. I mean, uh, uh, a system like that of an aircraft has plenty of sensors with lots of data coming in at every point in time, right? Humongous amounts of data. So, and it's often very difficult. I'm not sure how many of you have seen the interface in front of a pilot it's extremely difficult to parse. Okay, you have to be trained to be able to parse that subsystem in front of uh, in front of you. And often only an important part of it gets highlighted to the pilot. Okay? So now, how do you make decisions on the fly? Let's say a particular pilot is asked to f drop 1,000 feet. Okay? Now, if that was decision was given by a machine learning algorithm, does the pilot, should the pilot follow it, not follow it? Would the pilot ask for an explanation why it needs to be done? Right? Those are some things to think about here. And that's the focus of uh, uh, explainable ML, because in these kinds of applications, the cost of a bad decision 
can be very very high okay? the cost of a bad decision can be life and death okay? those are situations in which we don't trust ml yet okay? those are situations in which we don't trust accuracy may not be the only objective okay? it's okay if the performance is not as good if the explanation is something that's rationalizable okay? that's something that you definitely want which is what is good with humans humans can i can recognize the objects in front of me but if you ask me why is that a monitor i can give an explanation okay how i give the explanation even we don't know how the human brain works and how those connections fire we still have not understood but at least i can rationalize it to some extent which is something existing ml systems cannot do okay and there is a need for a multi dimensional perspective rather than look at just one particular performance metric like an accuracy or an f1 score you probably need a different holistic way of looking at how an ml system is performing okay uh, so now the question is what then do we really need beyond all of these accuracies and all of these metrics that we use today what do we really need in ml okay so some of the wish lists here are we want a human understandable rationale in decision making okay we want uh, when a decision is made some rationale which is human understandable i think uh, for those of you i thought i should definitely mention this because i'm sure many of you in the industry have heard of the gdpr that's now out i think if by the eu am i correct i think uh, eu is already passed it from may of this year so one of the important contentions in that particular in the gdpr uh, uh, entire documentation was uh, if there was data and that data was uh, acted upon by an automated system then how does that deal i mean how uh, if that data pertain to a particular person was the decision was made by an automated system how do you provision for uh, data protection in those kinds of scenarios okay, that was a very very important point and i mean the only way to handle those scenarios is if your prediction models can explain its decision rather than blindly take data and just give an output okay so uh, trust or confidence in a system is something that we want okay it's not uh, in addition to rationalizing you want i mean i'm sure uh, in any kind of a system where you use machine learning for a new product or for a new service in any upper level management in fact i think i have a statistic where uh, pwc recently conducted a survey and apparently two thirds of ceos around the world felt that stakeholders will start losing confidence in companies using ai okay so it seems surprising mainly because you really cannot have confidence when a new system comes up whether the ml decisions that you're getting out of that system are really useful are really worth trusting in is something difficult to promise okay compliance with ethical principles so this is actually a uh, you can look up this link there is actually a statement from gartner that says that by 2018 half of business ethics violations will occur through improper use of big data analytics okay which is a pretty tall claim uh, i'm not sure exactly when this link was out i'm not sure if these statistics is true right now but that was the claim from uh, gartner okay so compliance with ethical principles is another reason why we need explainability right so if you use machine learning as a black black box you're not sure i mean this is a huge topic in machine learning now i'm not sure how many of you are aware bias in machine learning is a huge topic today because remember that machine learning today is completely dependent on what data sets drive machine learning and if data sets are caucasian maybe it's not applicable for indians right so uh, that kind of a bias that's built into data sets is a huge problem and now if you're going to rely on that for deciding on people's lives that's going to that just doesn't make sense so that's where ethics into, fills into the uh, comes into the picture and bias in machine learning is a huge topic in machine learning conferences like nips and icml at this point in time okay so enhance control and robustness so if you understood how a system works you know how to play with it you know how to control it if you know it doesn't work in this setting because of this reason you know that you probably have to give data of a particular setting to that system to make it work better okay and finally openness and discover openness of discovery and scientific research if you understand the system you know how to improve it okay so all of these things are something that's important for us to take ml to the next uh, to the next space so for those of you who have read more in this space you would see various kinds of uh, uh, terms that people use in this context explainability trust interpretability and it's a new topic in machine learning it's been around i think it became popular when darpa introduced a huge huge initiative a couple of years back called explainable ai so in the last two years it's taken off and there have been a, a, a lot of efforts and I'll, i do have a slide that summarizes many efforts uh, uh, all the efforts so far to a reasonable extent at least so uh, there's been a recent work uh, just released last month on archive where they tried to categorize all of these uh, methods and define the terms more succinctly uh, there have been two three papers in this space but i'm going to subscribe to this particular definition here 
so uh, they define interpretability as uh, trying to understand what a model is doing or has done okay so if a machine learning model gave you a prediction what did it do to get to arrive at that decision is what we are going to call interpretability explainability is a little bit more abstract okay explainability is can your explainable model give the reasons for neural network behavior can it gain the trust of users can it give you insights or uh, causes for decisions that's slightly a higher level of abstraction rather than try to understand just what went did this neuron fire that neuron fire that would be interpretability if you want to give a human uh, interpretable explanation for a decision that would actually become explainability okay so that's the definition uh, we are going to go with i think that's uh, Uh, it's definitely debatable i think this is still a new nomenclature i think the field is growing at this point in time these kinds of terms and formalizations for these approaches are still being defined i'll talk about that when we come to the open problems at the end but this is the definition that i'll uh, go with at this point in time okay. so if you look at today's machine learning models uh, you can uh, so this is the statistic that i was talking about 67% of business leaders that took part in a ceo survey in 2017 said that ai and automation will impact negatively on stakeholder trust levels in the industry in the next 5 years and one of the reasons is you don't know whether to believe whether the model will work or not okay so everybody wants to use ml in their products and services but you there's no way to uh, find a robust way to check whether it will work or not other than metrics that could be biased themselves okay so if you look at existing machine learning models this is a rough chart of uh, how uh, Uh, how they perform on the accuracy versus interpretability trade off so neural networks and deep learning is somewhere here most accurate today have won most challenges but not interpretable at all then you have support vector machines random forest k nearest neighbors decision trees linear regression uh, on that on that particular spectrum as you can see decision trees may not be as accurate okay but they are some of the most interpretable models for obvious reasons because decision trees you can actually look at the variables and say why a particular decision was was made So, in some sense, well, a random forest is a medium ground between these because an ensemble of decision trees, random forest, performs a little better than a single decision tree. But again, you can it, you cannot give as good an explanation as decision trees because you have to aggregate your decision trees and come up with an explanation. But it performs a little better than a, a decision tree in terms of uh, accuracy. Okay. So, uh, so your current Uh, today's frontier of machine learning is on this spectrum right if you want to perform better on accuracy you're going to lose on interpretability but what we want to go for for tomorrow's machine learning models is improve both of them simultaneously okay so you want models that perform well both on accuracy metric as well as in terms of explainability okay so that's what we want to go towards so uh, where do we stand today in terms of uh, efforts in this space so uh, again it's uh, in the last 2 3 years there have been plenty of efforts in trying to uh, do different ways of trying to explain machine learning models uh, i should uh, say that there have been efforts even in the 80s and 90s in trying to understand uh, how uh, neural networks can be converted to decision trees that in in a in a manner in which you could explain your decisions and so on uh, so, so some of these uh, uh, keywords here talk about those kinds of models i'll probably briefly go over them so i'm again going with uh, the categorization in this particular paper in terms of uh, looking at all of these uh, work and trying to put them in bins so there have been a few different models in recent years that have tried to look at uh, explainability in terms of uh, processing okay and i'll explain what that means in a moment and there have been a few efforts in terms of trying to directly produce explanations and finally there have been a few efforts in terms of trying to understand representations and so on i'll briefly go over all of them but before uh, if any of you are actively working in this space so maybe Uh, in this categorization for those of you who have used uh, lime anyone who has used lime here okay so if you've used lime lime is uh, it's pretty popular i know it's pretty popular in the industry i've heard uh, many industry use cases of it so uh, that's that can be binned into a proxy kind of a method uh, then for those of you who looked at cam grad cam and things like that which i'll talk about in more detail as we go those would go into the saliency maps kind of uh, in that bin of these kinds of methods so let's look at some of these methods uh, so linear proxy models stand for Uh, so there could be many other categorizations of these explainable explainable models too so one traditional way people look at uh, various efforts so far in explainability is uh, model agnostic uh, methods and uh, and just methods that depend on the model what that means is model agnostic methods are you use whatever you want for a machine learning model svm neural nets decision trees whatever you want then you use something as a meta meta method to try to understand 
what the model actually tried to, uh, uh, or rather what were the relationships between the input and output of that particular model, be it SVM, be it decision tree. Those are model agnostic methods. And then model dependent methods are where if you use an SVM for uh, classifying, you try to go deeper into that particular SVM and try to understand why it made a particular decision. Okay, those are another, that's another way of classifying uh, machine learning models uh, today. So linear proxy methods refer to the models where uh, are broadly model agnostic uh, methods where you've trained a machine learning model and it's a black box model to you at this point in time. It's trained using whatever ML algorithm you wanted. So now you try to play with your input and output and try to find which which uh, space in your input corresponded to a particular output the most and so on and so forth. Okay, So in, in a broad sense, these kinds of models, there's also something called SHAP, uh, SHAP and so on and so forth. Broadly, these kinds of models are, you can say, are an extension of are, are a formalization of sensitivity and sensitivity analysis methods. So, because in uh, traditional statistics, what you would do to get explanations would be sensitivity analysis. You perturb your input a little bit and see what happens to the output and so on and so forth. Okay, those are what these kinds of models do. Then decision trees, you already know. I mean, decision trees are what uh, help make decisions directly. But by decision trees here, I'm also referring to methods in the past where people have converted neural networks to decision trees. There have been methods in the 90s and there have also been some recent methods, uh, you can probably look at this particular paper down, they go deeper into this kind of a classification. So uh, so that's uh, uh, any method that tries to convert a machine learning model to a decision tree to give an explanation falls into these kinds of methods. CLNC maps is more in, uh, I think in vision and text perhaps, where you process the deep learning model on a particular vision or text input, and then you try to find out which part of the image or which part of the text was the network focusing on while making a particular decision. Okay, so that's another way of doing it. And we'll that's the uh, kind of models I'm going to talk about for the remaining duration of the talk. Then automatic rule extraction is, uh, it could, it's in some sense related to decision trees, but there are also other kinds of methods where you can extract rules from a given model based on various kinds of methods. Again, I'm not going to step into each of them. If any of you are interested, I'll uh, refer you to this particular paper here. Then uh, there are also explanation producing methods where people try to come up with script, uh, scripted conversations. So you try to, or what, these are also called generative models, where uh, you train your model to generate an explanation. For those of you aware of GANs and generative adversarial networks. So instead of generating an image, you generate an explanation for a given prediction. Okay, so assume you have a data set where you have uh, a particular problem that you're working on, as well as the corresponding textual explanations for the predictions then you train a GAN to be able to give an explanation in real time. Okay, so that's another family of models there. Attention-based models are, as a, uh, are where you have an attention module within your neural network, and that attention module tells you which part of the, uh, it's slightly different from saliency maps because you, uh, uh, image captioning is a good example for uh, attention-based systems here, where if you're trying to uh, take an image and you want to uh, train a deep learning model to give a caption for that particular image, then you use an attention module inside your deep learning network and that at attention module uh, tells you which part of the image uh, the model was looking at while while throwing out a particular word in your or a phrase in your caption okay so those are traditionally binned into attention models and broadly speaking all these disentangling uh, representations uh, methods so how many of you are familiar with vaes uh, variational auto encoders so variational auto encoders there's also something called infogan with gans so these kinds of methods try to learn a latent space where the data belongs to and then go from the latent space towards a prediction. Okay? So the latent space can be cons considered as a disentangled set of representations. For example, a uh, typical example that's used in VAEs and InfoGANs is if you had a bunch of face images and let's say you want to generate more first face images, you try to come to a low dimensional space, a latent space, where a particular dimension corresponds to a beard on the face, a particular dimension corresponds to glasses on the face, so on and so forth. Okay? So then when a decision is made, you can try to see which latent variable fired and then try to say, I classified this person as so-and-so because he or she had a beard or uh, had a glasses on or so on and so forth. Okay, So that's how uh, all these methods for disentangling representations fit into the scope of explainability. Okay? And lastly, uh, uh, there are also methods that try to uh, uh, study what are the roles of particular layers, what are the roles of particular neurons, what are the roles of particular vector representations that you get out of a network, all of those also can be considered as trying to interpret or explain neural networks. Okay, so I'm not going to step into all of them, but that's another broad space that uh, uh, that uh, 
can be looked at as explaining uh, uh, deep deep models. Okay, just a, uh, I'll just talk about one of the models which is very popular, Lime. So Lime is a model, a local. It stands for local interpretable model agnostic explanations. Where given a model, and this is your prediction, irrespective of whatever model you used here, it doesn't matter whether you used SVM, decision tree, neural networks, whatever you used, you give it to Lime, and then Lime gives you a decision uh, of what feature could have led to a particular decision. Okay, and uh, the way it goes about doing it, they show in their paper they actually show results with text as well as images. So the way they go about it is you take a particular image or any data point, then you perturb in the neighborhood of that data point, and then you try to see what output you get, and then you regress on those perturbed instances in the output, and then try to get which feature gave uh, is most likely to have led to a particular output. Okay. So uh, for those of you who don't know about it, you can I think there's a the, they have the code and it's very popularly used uh, for anybody who tries to at least I have heard several industry use cases of uh, people using Lime uh, to explain decisions. All right, so that's the brief uh, uh, overview of explainability in ML as it stands today, and I'll come back to what are open questions at this point. So we'll take a detour to visual interpretability in CNNs. So that's uh, some work that we have done in that space also. So just uh, for those of you who are very new to deep learning, just a quick two to three slide introduction. So that's a neural network, okay, and it's trained using backpropagation and gradient descent, and you have a loss function that's used, and you backpropagate using the loss, uh, use gradient descent and backpropagation to train based on the loss function and update the weights of the neural network. And what's a convolutional neural network or a CNN? Uh, you don't connect weights directly, and you don't use what's, an, what's called an inner product between your uh, first layer and the next layer. You use convolution rather to do it, and you use a concept of sharing parameters. And uh, the main uh, operation that you use in a convolutional neural network is convolution. Convolution is where uh, if you have a bunch of parameters that are defined by a matrix, then you have the weights also defined by a matrix. Convolution is nothing but, at least 2D convolution is nothing but inner product of this matrix and a doubly inverted version of this matrix. Okay? So that's the simple definition of convolution for those of you who don't have a signal processing background. So you have a matrix, you have another matrix here, you invert this matrix both horizontally and vertically and then do an inner product between uh, every window here and this particular matrix and you'll get a value as an output and that becomes your output of your convolution. Okay, I'll leave it at, uh, with that uh, uh, simple definition. So a convolutional layer in a neural network is where you have an input image. It could have multiple channels. For example, if you have a color image, you would have R, G, B. That are, those are three, uh, three, three channels there. And then a receptive field is the size of the convolutional filter that you use, the filter that you have. And based on that, you come up with an output map. The output of convolution is an image. If you have an image, and you applied weights to it, unlike a standard MLP, you get an image as an output, and you could have multiple feature maps that le 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 leads to a depth in your output. So unlike uh, traditional uh, MLPs, where you have to decide the number of neurons in each layer, in this case, the neurons are pre-decided once you decide the number of weights and a few other parameters, okay, like uh, valid convolution and so on and so forth. And you also use activations like ReLUs and so on and so forth. I'm mentioning this because these are some things that we'll use as we go forward. And in a CNN, you also have something called a pooling layer, where you take a, a patch of an uh, output of a convolutional layer, and then you aggregate it. The aggregation could happen using a max, average, L2. You can use any kind of a pooling. And for example, if you had an image such as this, and you do a max pooling, so you take a region, two cross two region here, and then you take a max of it, put it here, so on and so forth. That's your uh, max pooling layer. And then to put together your vanilla CNN, you have a convolutional layer, a pooling layer, a convolutional layer, a pooling layer. There could be blocks where you don't have a pooling layer, have only a convolutional layer. Uh, and finally, you have a fully connected layer, and then you have a softmax classifier at the end. So that's your overall architecture for a convolutional neural network. Again, this is a simplistic one. These days, you have normal batch normalization, normalization layers. You have uh, skip connections and residual blocks, many other uh, variants of this. But this is just your abstraction of what is a convolutional neural network. Okay, so uh, now uh, trying to understand CNNs, one simple way people have always tried to understand CNNs is you look at the weights that you have learned in your neural network. Remember, weights in CNNs are also matrices. So if you plot them as images, it gives you an idea of what the neural network is trying to do. That's one of the simplistic ways in which you uh, try to understand what's going on. And it's typically known that if you take the first layer of weights and visualize them, you get filters such as these. So you, and these typically look like uh, the, your basic image processing systems of your visual cortex where you look at uh, 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 textures and e edges and edges of different uh, orientations and textures and so on and so forth. 
Unfortunately, these kind of weights are interpretable only in the first layer. If you go further down the, uh, uh, if you go further down the uh, network, you really cannot understand what's going on uh, in these kinds of weights. But to interpret CNNs, the last few years there have been a few different efforts. So one of the efforts has been to use uh, backpropagation methods, where you assume that your CNN is a is a black box, which is a function, which means you can backpropagate straight from the output to the input instead of backpropagating backpropagating with respect to the weight. You do do f by do x instead of doing do f by do w. Okay, so it's a simple uh, chain rule change. And once you do that, you can now try to backprop with respect to a particular class and try to see where the gradient was most activated in a particular image. So once you train an AlexNet kind of a model for the image in a database, then you take the cat class and try to see where was the gradient most activated for this particular image. It shows these regions. And that gives an indication of what part of the image the network was looking at for a given, for a given image. So there has been an extension to these kinds of methods and uh, there have been a couple of efforts called deconvolution networks and guided backpropagation where you use a ReLU activation function, a rectified linear uh, unit activation function. And in a deconvolution network, what you do is, uh, I mean, when you backpropagate, you change wherever the inputs were negative, you don't allow those gradients to come back, back to the image. Okay? So in the same backprop approach that we saw on the earlier slide, wherever you had a ReLU activation, you don't allow those negative gradients to backprop to the image. And then there was an improvement called guided backpropagation, where both the activations that turned out to be negative, as well as the gradients that turned out to be negative. Okay? Remember, ReLU is an activation, gradient is backwards. right? If both are negative, you don't allow any of those gradients to go back to the original image. So that was called guided backpropagation. And they showed that if you use deconvolution or guided backpropagation, uh, it helps you understand what the network was looking at more clearly. I mean, the main idea is don't worry about the negative influences in your network. Look at only the positive influences in your network and you'll get a better idea of what the network was looking at while making a prediction. Okay, that's the idea in this particular, uh, in this, in this particular framework. Okay? But there have been some limitations of guided backpropagation. If you use a cat class versus a dog class, it still ends up focusing on the same region irrespective of what class you try to do. And that led to the proposal of one particular method called class activation maps. Okay. So in class activation maps, this was proposed in CVPR of uh, 2016, where they said that you, when you need to explain, you need to look at it with respect to a particular class. Okay. So what they do in their particular uh, uh, model is you have a convolutional neural network. And then after all your convolutional layers, you take the last convolutional layer, and then you do something called global average pooling. You take each of those feature maps in that last convolution layer and just average all of the values in one particular feature map and represent it by one particular value here. So you take the blue feature map here, average all the values in that particular image represented by one value here. So on and so forth for all the feature maps here. Okay. And then you train a linear classifier to learn the weights between each of these aggregated feature maps and each of the classes. So you have to learn, if you had 1000 classes, you would learn 1000 regressors to be able to get these weights for each of these aggregated feature maps and your output. And once you have that, if you take a particular class called Aust Australian Terrier, you know how that it was, how it was weighted with respect to each of these feature maps. And that, if you put them together, you get an idea of what the network was looking at while giving a particular class as the output. Using this approach, they showed that, I mean, if you take this particular image, this is an image of a dome. And you can see that if it's classified as a palace, it looks at this part of the image. If it's classified as a dome, it looks at this part of the image. If it's classified as a church, it looks at only this part. It doesn't look at that entire facade there, and then so on and so forth. So it gives an indication of what the network was looking at while making a particular class prediction. Unfortunately, the problem with the CAM approach that we saw on the previous slide is you have to, after you train the CNN, you still have to train 1,000 regressors for each of your classes that you have in your model. That's a problem. Okay? And that led to the definition of what is called GRAC CAM, which is called gradient-based uh, CAM where they realized that these weights that you're trying to learn in CAM actually can be obtained directly from the gradients. The weights that you have is nothing but do y with respect to the activation map. Okay? If you take do y with respect to the activation maps, that is directly your weight. You don't need to train regressors further to learn those weights between your uh, activation maps and your output. And that led to this uh, method called GRADCAM, which is again popularly used for uh, saliency, uh, saliency maps today. This is your overall architecture for GradCam, where you uh, 
I mean, you take those weights from the gradients and then you do a relu on those gradients, which means uh, any negative gradient, you don't allow it to pass. You just wind up in two minutes. Okay. Uh, five moments. All right. Okay. So, uh, and then you take the, you don't allow the negative gradients. Again, the same idea of not taking the negative gradients is to look at only positive influences. Okay. And why only negative, why are negative gradients not being involved? I mean, it just, uh, empirically, they saw better results when you use only positive gradients. The interpretability was much higher. Okay, that's, that's about it. Okay. And they also combined this with guided backpropagation, which we saw on the earlier slide, which means you don't have uh, any gradient corresponding to a negative activation or a negative gradient. Okay, both of those are set to zero when you go back to the gradient. And with this kind of an approach, they actually found that you could actually get discriminative saliency maps with respect to each class. And uh, these are some sample results of uh, their work on image captioning models. So you can see that they showed that as you caption, you can look at different parts of the image when you give different words as output at each step. So one of the limitations in our work that we found on this particular model is that whenever there were multiple objects in the scene, okay, or when there's a full object, the network ended up focusing on part of the object or could not look at multiple objects. Okay? And that led us to come up with a different formulation from our perspective. I mean, I'm just going to give the conceptual overview. I mean, you can ignore the math. What we realized with the GradCam approach was that it was looking at the weights as an entire aggregation of their feature map, not looking at it pixel-wise. Okay? While we felt that there was an explanation that was required pixel-wise uh, with respect to an activation map and the output. And we realized that you could change the formulation a little bit by making your weights that you're trying to learn between your activation map and your output. And remember, both GradCam and the work that I'm presenting right now can be done with respect to any layer of the CNN. Okay, those activation maps can be with respect to any layer. I, I'm just demonstrating it with respect to the last layer. Okay? So we found that that gradients can be weighted with respect to each of those pixels in the image. And it happens that you can get an easy closed form solution. If you work out a math, it turns out that you can actually get an easy closed form solution, which means this, it's just a simple one line code where you can evaluate this expression and then try to get the a better uh, activation, uh, better weight of those activation maps with respect to uh, uh, the your output. And using this, we could find that if you have uh, multiple objects in your scene, it gives a more holistic uh, saliency map. Uh, I mean, these are examples of different, here is a, a flamingo. You can see that GradCam actually gives only a part of the image, whereas the GradCam++, which is our work that was accepted at WCV this year, uh, so that could give a more holistic saliency map uh, in this particular context. Here are more examples. Uh, okay, here is an example where you have a gray whale that's peeking out of an ocean. You can see that GradCam gives a pretty hazy uh, representation of what your network is looking at, whereas our model could give better, better results. Okay, I'm not going to go too much. You obviously know that if you got a paper, we probably had some good results. Okay, so I'm not going to go uh, into that too much. If you're any, if you're more interested, so we had some results on image captioning, and we had some results on uh, doing this on videos too. So we had some. Uh, how do you explain decisions on videos? That's also something that we have in our work. I think ours was the first to be done in the space of videos. So if you're interested, our code is available and our archive paper is available. So we also have some ongoing work on how do you do this for. We are trying to use causality in trying to do this for. How do you explain decisions of RNNs? That's some ongoing work that we currently have with uh, uh, time series kind of data. If, you know, if you're interested, I can talk offline. Okay, I won't go too much into that. Let me spend the last couple of minutes on just trying to see uh, open directions here. So this is the space of methods that we briefly saw uh, in the last uh, half an hour or so. So now what are open questions at this point in the space? What are research directions, right? So one of the first problems here is, so now we all know that machine learning has a certain formalization, right? You have f going from x to y, where x is input data, y is the output. You try to learn a function f. That can be learned using a maximum margin classifier. It can be learned using a neural network. It can be learned using a probabilistic framework, so on and so forth. Okay? What is a formalization for explainable ML? We still don't know. Okay? There was a recent paper that's trying to, uh, that was published last, week, uh, last month that tried to do something in this space, but I think there's a lot more work to be done in terms of how do you formalize machine learning when explainability is very required. And then how do you balance the accuracy performance with this interpretability trade-off? Is interpretability always required? I think is a question. I mean, maybe it's not required in several applications. There are only certain set of applications where you, maybe there's a need to stratify applications and say these kinds of applications, a certain quality of interpretability service is required. Okay, those kinds of things have to emerge in this particular context. What kind of data, what class of problems are more amenable for explainable systems? If you had uh, data on the real space, is that better? If you have data in the discrete space, is that better? Those are all open questions at this point in time. If you had a multi-class problem, a binary class problem, what kind of uh, problems 
would explainable systems be needed? Where would they work better? And how to, uh, an important question, I'm done, just one more slide. Uh, how to evaluate explainable systems? What kind of metrics do you use? Is all open at this point in time. Okay. I think I'll stop there. Uh, so these are some reference and resources if any of you want to take away. And yeah, I'm here for any questions and discussion. Uh, so we're out of time. Since we have a break, uh, we can uh, continue with the questions. I'll make the announcements first. So uh, those of you who don't want to uh, ask questions can uh, uh, go for lunch. Uh, Walmart has a contest going on at their booth. So if you want to win a wireless headset, you can participate in that. BOF on AI and product will start at 140 in the BOF area, which is on the first floor. And uh, remember to fill your feedback forms. Okay, we can continue with the questions. Anybody? Sure, yeah, any questions? Hi, uh, nice talk. One uh, question you. based on your previous slide. Uh, how, how do you evaluate the current explainable system? So you said that that's an open problem. On uh, uh, How do you evaluate the current explanation? Your second last point is about the evaluation. Of yeah, the I mean, uh, so I skimmed over systems. it. I mean, okay, that's yeah. a very, very important point. I mean, how do you evaluate explainable systems? We still don't have. I mean, those are mechanisms that you have to develop. So again, there has been some recent work which have proposed some metrics. So in the work that we have published so far, I mean, you typically use some human subjects and see if the explanations were good enough. I mean, you use a, a, a broader range of subjects so that you know that uh, across the population, you felt the explanations were good enough. That's one way of doing it. Since we were doing the saliency maps kinds of approach, there are multiple things that you can do. You can hide the rest of the image and look at only that part of the image that our saliency map produced, and then run it through a CNN and see how the prediction was. Did it improve the accuracy is a question to ask. Then if it did improve the accuracy, yeah, perhaps that was the part of the image that was most relevant. So you can play around a little bit with those kinds of methods too. So all these are in some sense hacks, I would say. I wouldn't call them evaluation formalisms at this point in time. But uh, those are some methods people use. So it depends on, I think broadly at this point in this space, it's all application driven, whichever application you have, you just look at that. But I think that's an open question at this point in time. Uh, hey Vineet, it was a very nice talk. Uh, so what we see is that for most of the explainable models that we have, we are trying to reproduce the same result uh -huh. using a simpler model. For example, we are uh, piggybacking on decision trees. That's one approach. That's Th one approach. That's one approach. That's correct, yes. But, but that gives the more accurate uh, explainable part where we can uh, uh, get the direct result. But what I'm trying to ask is, do you think that this is a good solution? I mean, there are many non-linear relationships and sure. other models, sure. okay, which actually did the hard work. Mm -hmm. And then we are trying to, you know, ram all of that into sure. a simpler decision tree. Sure. So a as you mentioned that it is a hack, but sure, do you think yes. that this hack is something that we should even try out and... Got it. I think that's a good question. So firstly, I mean, decision trees are not the only way to explain. I mean, it's just, uh, just that... Just that it's more human interpretable. I mean, we are all pretty easy to look at if then else rules and uh, make 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 decisions at this point in time. So that's the reason that people prefer decision trees. But definitely no. I mean, that's not the only way. And I mean, the answer to that question, what your question is again related to that, is we still don't have evaluation formalisms for explainability, right? So uh, uh, another way of asking your question is: Is decision trees the right way to evaluate? I mean, is that kind of an output the right way to look at whether a particular explainable model was useful, right? So that's another way of asking the same question. We don't have an answer to that question at this point in time. I mean, all of this is very nascent. I mean, this entire space is, I think, growing as we speak. Hey, um, Vineet will be available offline, so you can continue the discussion, yeah. Okay, I, uh, I don't know if this has to be done offline or right now, so the only thing was, Oh, okay. So it's, it's more about causality in uh, RNN that you just talked about sure. maybe due to short of shortage of time we couldn't talk about. So just wanted to do, wanted to know more on that. Okay. It's actually under review at this point in time. Uh, but maybe I can talk offline, but the overall idea is uh, we use causality. I mean, so there's a fundamental difference between which I think machine learning today does not, does not do machine learning, deep learning, none of them do is to segregate the difference between causality and correlation, right? All machine learning models today are correlation driven. Right? So I think there's a very popular example of uh, correlation versus causality. I think there's a statistic of uh, people buying ice creams in summer. Okay? You, you plot a graph over the months of the year, like Jan to December, you plot the graph. And then uh, when sharks appear on the beach of an ocean or something like that, I think this was done in the Bay Area, if I'm right. 
okay, and then you have uh, uh, the same chart on the on the same chart you plot a graph of that. You find that the charts are very very similar. Okay, they have similar charts for uh, both of these cases. Does that mean that you eat ice cream because a shark came up on the shore? Not really, right? So the data is correlated, but they're not causal. One doesn't cause the other. But often in explainability, what we are looking for is what caused a particular output to happen, right? And that's where causal models come into the picture. So we've tra been trying to look at, uh, can you use causal models? There is, I mean, entire literature on that by Judia Pearl. I think he's a Turing Award winner if you're not uh, aware of that literature. It's has been, it actually has been a niche area in machine learning for many years, but I think explainability is kind of reviving it at this point in time. So uh, our idea there is to use, uh, you be assume that each node of a neural network is like a random variable, and it's a graphical model, but it's a it's it's what we call a structural causal model, where you can study the causal relationships between those random variables, and then we try to see which input random variable had the maximum. Uh, uh, Maybe we can talk offline more about it. I don't want to spend too much time. But that's our overall approach to that particular problem. I mean, if required, we can talk offline for. Yeah. Hi. Uh, here. Sure. So uh, you have shown an uh, example of GradCam sure. for CNN on uh -huh. image data. So CNN can be used not only on image data, but uh, there are some applications in text data sure. and sure. Uh, all. Yes. So uh, can this GradCam be generalized for CNNs? which are used in different domains, maybe in text, maybe in some financial data I representation. Think, yes. Methodology wise, there's nothing that restricts it from, I mean, I know people use CNNs in speech for as spectrograms and in uh, even in text as 1D CNNs and so on and so forth. Methodology wise, that there's nothing that restricts it from being used. I'm not, uh, I know there have been some efforts recently on uh, CLNC maps for text and things like that, but I'm not very sure if GradCam has been applied per se. I mean, I know there have been similar efforts, but not GradCam per se, I'm not very uh, sure. Yes, hey, I mean. Follow-ups offline, follow-ups offline. Okay, sure, okay. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to ask, because most of the times uh, our models work, but uh -huh. some of the times it doesn't work. Sure. So do you think we have to also think about that uh, aspect of the solution? And can we use existing uh, explainable models or solutions to uh, explain those kind of scenarios where model is not working? Because one of the scenarios, like we have a stop sign, and if we change the bits of that image, that represents a, to model as a triangle. That, that is quite a big problem, right? It means we, we have to explain also that why it did not work on that one. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I have two thoughts to that. I mean, firstly, I think in, in some sense it's related to the, because when you say a model does not work, often when you say, the moment you say it does not work, you have to talk in terms of a performance metric. Right? And often you talk about that in terms of an accuracy. Right? And that goes back to this accu accuracy versus interpretability trade-off and trying to see where is the balance between those. Okay, that's one angle. But the other angle perhaps that I did not speak about is in this entire talk is the relationship of this entire discussion that we've had to adversarial data. Right? I think many of you who are active in deep learning, you've probably read about the adversarial attacks and defenses and so on and so forth. Right? I mean, that becomes an important uh, uh, relation to explainability because if a small perturbation in the data is going to get a, class, a cat classified as a dog, I mean, the neural network is, uh, good luck to neural network to explaining that. I mean, it's not going to be easy, right? So explainability is going to be very hard when you have adversarial attacks. So actually, there's a very close relationship between uh, that space of work in deep learning to explainability. And because let's say GradCam works and you get an excellent explanation for a cat being classified as a cat, and the, tomorrow you just add a simple Gaussian noise, and then it gets classified as a cat, where did that explanation go? Right? And the image is almost the same from a human eye. Right? So there's a close relationship which is not being studied at this point. It's, a, it's an open problem at this point in time. Hey, um, so I had a, uh, a question about Lime. So sure. Lime usually deals with uh, the local space and the sample that uh, we are providing it. That's right? so it's a uh, individual specific uh, explanation. Yeah. So is there any research uh, that is going on right now uh, which is extrapolating it to the global space? Or yes, yes, very much, yes. I mean, I would again recommend you to look at that particular paper that categorizes all of these methods. I think one of the categorizations they talk about is also global methods. So in fact, uh, the method that we proposed with the causal RNN, I didn't get a chance to talk more about that, can do both local and global. I mean, that was our main, uh, I mean, that was our main uh, uh, USP of that work. Okay. We try to do, so given a particular instance you want to explain, but you want that to hold for your entire data set also. Right? So 
there are uh, efforts in that space. So far, I think uh, we have not seen work that the same explanation method that tries to do both local and global, we have not seen. So simple feature selection methods are global. Right? Any feature selection method is global. I mean, that space has been active for decades together in machine learning. But yeah, Lime is local. 